Greetings and salutations. Welcome to the ProCame stage here at Sony Creative Space Online. I will be your host for this Tips and Tricks Volume 1 class. My name is Barrett McGivney. And as we get started, if you are not familiar with who I am uh, and you've never attended a class hosted by ProCam Online, I am that guy. I am the rep for all three of the ProCam locations uh, in the Midwest. Um, as you can see in the slide in front of you are some samples of my work. Uh, I like to do a lot of different things when it comes to photography because I really like to challenge myself uh, and I don't want to become stagnant um, and I don't want to be bored. Uh, and that's just how I am. So in my career, uh, which started off as a teenager. I did a lot of freelancing. I shot weddings and portraits, uh, events, um, developed a, a you know an interest in air show photography. I've always been a fan of movies, especially horror movies, which is, you know, I've had that opportunity to shoot uh, like special effects makeup like you see at the, that top screen right there. Uh, and I just got to send a little prop out to uh, the, the gentleman that's in that makeup. His name is uh, J. Anthony Kozar, who is a local artist in general, but is also a special effects uh, makeup guy for TV and movie. And he's also the person who sculpted that uh, alien head uh, at the very bottom. And that is the first thing that I ever shot with a full frame Sony mirrorless camera and a G Master lens. And it's, uh, that was that image that when I made the transition from the guys in red and yellow to orange, um, I was, you know, I was really excited and was caught off guard with uh, that moment of hesitation. Did I do the right thing? And when I was shooting that sculpture there uh, for Anthony is I set up my lights, took a picture, blew it up on the back of the screen and said, I have nothing to worry about. I did a really smart thing. And it really put to bed any uh, reservations I had or second guessing I had about the job because my other systems were known and this was, this was new. It was a little scary, so I, I knew it was real. But when I did make that change from a DSLR to a mirrorless camera, I did see that the menu system had increased with features. So there's more stuff to go through. And I know that can be a little bit daunting when you're making the switch uh, from say one of the other guys, or you're just coming into the Sony system because maybe you've been shooting with just strictly your, your smartphone and now you actually wanna have better quality pictures. So please don't be you know overwhelmed by what you see. You have some amazing resources at your disposal. The primary one is alphauniverse.com. Now, this is all things, you know, Sony Alpha, so all our camera gear. You know, it is a great resource for information on our products, so you can have a better understanding of the, the technical side of things. But where it really shines like a supernova is as a resource for inspiration and education. So if you want to check it out, uh, you will find articles from our Artisans of Imagery, our Imaging Collective. Uh, they will post articles on different topics. As a matter of fact, here's a, the cover page from earlier this week uh, announcing a new app called Visual Story, which I'll talk about further on down the road. But it's also where you can see when we have events coming up, you can see camera reviews. If you take a look up here in the upper right hand corner, you see the little magnifying glass, that's the search tab. You click on that, type in a topic of interest. Maybe you're a portrait photographer and maybe you wanna get into macro or you're the macro photographer who wants to get into portrait, you know, for portraits. You know, you'll see articles from uh, Tony Gale, Miguel Quiles, Scott Robert Lim. Uh, if you're in sports, Patrick Murphy Racy. If you're more of a video centric person, uh, Amber and Garrett Baird from Dynamics. You know, if you're more of a fine art photographer or you want to get into fine art, where you have uh, articles from Brooke Shaden. Yeah, Brian Smith, who's a Pulitzer Prize winning photographer, is also one of our artisans. So there's a lot of great material here at your disposal. So I really encourage you to check it out and you know, have some fun, explore your creative vision. You never know, something that you may have not been interested in before may spark that interest, it may just kind of grab on and just take you down a new road. And that's all good because you know, trying new things, especially in photography, it's not bad. You know, If it isn't fun, why do it? And this will help you get you started and give you some uh, recipes to start with. Now, also through the uh, Alpha Universe website, you have the ability to go in and 
see like accessory chart, what fits with your camera. You also have the esupport.sony.com, which is linked through the gear. And I'm gonna go back real quick. Up here in the gear tab, it'll actually, there's a drop down window that says firmware updates. When you click on that, it will actually show you a thumbnail of cameras and what their current firmware is. So you can very easily take a look and see what's existing. And which actually brings me to my first topic of conversation, which is firmware upgrades. Now, keep in mind is our cameras are basically mini computers and the camera bodies are gonna change every few years to a newer model. Now, just because it goes to a newer model does not necessarily mean that you have to a, buy a brand new camera. Now, uh, the, the perfect example is January, 2019, when we introduced the A6400. Now, when we introduced that A6400, which is part of our, our, our crop sensor or APS-C line of cameras, we introduced new technology. You know, two of those pieces of technology were real-time tracking and real-time eye autofocus tracking. And we also added interval recording into the camera. So typically what a lot of companies will do is that when they go to new technology is you want it, you've got to upgrade. Well, Sony didn't do that. What they did was they were able to put the technology in the previous generation cameras. You know, a good example is the A7R3 and the A7 III. Now, the R3 and 7 III didn't get all of the firmware updates. You know, with firmware updates, some things can be done through software. Other things require hardware. So we, we do what we can. You know, we got to work with the limitations of the gear itself. But with the R3 and the 7 III, you receive the real-time eye autofocus, real-time eye autofocus for animals, and interval recording. In the case of the A9, which had been out for almost two years, through the firmware update, it got a complete overhaul. It became a A9 Mark II through a firmware update before we released the A9 Mark II later in 2019. So it got the tracking for both uh, humans, animals, real-time tracking, it improved the usability. So we got a new menu layout. And then later in the year, it got it for animals and interval recording. So this was all done through firmware updates that were free. Now, to be able to check to see what firmware your camera is currently running is go into the menu system and you go to the setup tab, which looks like a toolbox or a lunchbox. One of my teammates on the West Coast calls it a suitcase. There's all the stuff that's packed into it. And you're going to look for version. Now, typically, it will be on the last page of the setup tab. If it's not there, it's probably going to be in the page before. So it just depends on your camera model. You may have seven pages. You may have more, may have less, but you'll find it within the, the last page or the page before. And then when you hit the center button on the back of the camera, it will show you the body, its classification as ILCE, which stands for Interchangeable Lens Camera e-mount. So with that, you'll see that it is a mirrorless camera. And then the actual body that you have, in this case, the 7R Mark III, when showing version 3.01. Ironically, I think the most current is 3.10. And then beneath that, you can actually see what the firmware version of the lens is. So on occasion, we'll do firmware updates with our lenses as well. So you'll be able to see what you're currently running. Now, I always recommend that you do the firmware updates. You know, it's you do them for your computer, you do them for your smartphones and your tablets. So it helps improve the performance. And sometimes it fixes bugs that some people run into some really weird situations and it helps take care of them as well. So always recommend doing the firmware update. Now, as I mentioned, you can go through the, the link on the gear tab through alphauniverse.com, or you can also go through eSupport dot sony.com there is no www it's just esupport dot sony.com and then in the search window type in your the model of your camera you can do the ilce you can even type 7r and it'll give you the list of models that you can that you can work with and then go to the download section and download the appropriate file if you need it based on the operating system of your computer now the files can be quite large. And in the case here, you've, you can see that we're working with an A7R2 and the file size is 254 megabytes. Pretty beefy uh, file size, right? So we do re require a laptop or a desktop 
to be able to complete the firmware update process. So, and there's a reason behind it, which I'll explain to you in a second. But I first want to make sure you have your camera prepped to receive the firmware update. So you're going to go back into the setup menu and you're going to look for the feature that says USB connection. Now, by default, it is set at auto. So once you find it, you're going to hit the center button on the back of the camera and set it to mass storage. You know, highlight it, press the center button, and you're going to lock it in. Now, if for some crazy reason you find it and you cannot access the sub menu, then the reason is, and it's kind of grayed out, kind of like similar to what you would see on the 4K output selection here right above, it means that there's a, a feature in the camera that's turned on and you need to turn it off. That typically is control with smartphone. Now, you'll have to go into the uh, network setting, which is right here. It looks like the globe or the basketball and look for control with smartphone. If it's turned on, turn it off, go back to USB connection and it'll be highlighted and lit up and you'll be able to go in to set it to mass storage. Now, one other piece too for the firmware updates is I always recommend that you use the cable that came with the camera itself. And here's the reason why, is that the cable that we provide for you with your camera, which is typically the micro USB connection, it is not only a power supply cord or a charging cord, it is also a data transfer cord. Not all cables out there do data transfer. Some are just be able to charge your device. That's not the case with the cable that comes with. Now, there are plenty of cables that are out there. You can test it. If you find one that is not a Sony that allows data transfer, that's okay. You know, kind of keep that one in mind. But I always recommend, you know, use the one that come with just to play it safe. So once you launch the app, you know, launch the software, plug the camera in, follow the instructions to the letter, dot your I's, cross your T's, go through the steps, you know, follow them in order. Uh, you know, as, a, as an example, say and run the update, there's 10 steps and, you know, step seven says stand on one leg and sing the Star Spangled Banner. Well, when you hit step seven, stand on one leg and sing the Star Spangled Banner. It's when you start hopscotching steps that you run into problems. So once you start it, it'll, it'll go, it'll finish up, you hit the finish button and follow the instructions. It's as simple as that. Now, if for some reason, the firmware update process gets interrupted before it finishes, don't panic. You know, to think of the Douglas Adams Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, don't panic right there in the cover, don't. The reason is, and this is why we use a computer, is that as it's writing the, uh, the firmware onto the camera, it's actually rewriting it from the previous. So if it does get interrupted, typically all you have to do is restart the update process and it picks up where it left off. Now, sometimes it won't do it on the initial restart. It may take a couple of tries. In my four and a half years as a tech rep for Sony, I've never had anyone have to go past three times as a restart to install the firmware. Now, if you get a little, you know, a little glitchy, that's like, well, did it really do that? If you try to do it like a fourth time or after it says it's installed, it'll say, you don't need to, it's fine because it does check. So that's the reason why. Typically what happens with my competitors is that if it's interrupted, it becomes a brick you know, a really good paperweight. So you'd have to send it back in to have them flash the, the internal memory, reinstall the operating system and then send it back to you. So that's time without your camera. And it's also a, a service charge. So here, we'll save you that. Now, once you've done your firmware updates, you know, then one of the steps uh, or other things to consider as well is extending your battery life. Now, since I don't have you in front of me, I can't ask who has an APS-C camera and who has a full frame camera. But if you do happen to have an APS-C camera, with the exception of the A6600, you are running the FW50 battery, or we commonly call the W50 battery. The W50 battery is a 1000 milliamp battery. It is typically half the size and half the capacity of my competitors. That's what helps you know, keep the camera size small. We did introduce a new battery, the Z100, with the introduction of the A9 in around April of 2017. And the Z100 is a 2200 milliamp battery. So it is 2.2 times as powerful. So you definitely get more life out of it. Where the W50, not as much in, the, in compared to it. So here are some suggestions that you can use to try and extend the battery life of the camera. One is turn on airplane mode. Now you may not know this is that the, our cameras produce their own Wi-Fi hotspot. So when you're out in the field, you can actually transfer images directly from your camera 
to your smartphone or use your smartphone as a remote control. And we'll talk about that towards the end of the presentation uh, with one of our free softwares uh, for mobile applications that you can use. The second thing you can uh, set is the pre-auto focus to off. That's what pre-AF stands for. It is a feature that came from the earlier days of Sony where when the camera was on, the camera was kind of working and the autofocus system was kind of working like a boxer shuffle. And the respects is that it was staying awake and it was wherever the focus point was at, it was trying to stay with it. So if you did push the shutter button halfway down, it would just automatically go right to the spot, be already prepared to focus on where the focusing point was at. So all you had to do is complete uh, the action of pushing the shutter button down, it would capture your image. So it was faster. And it thought it was like, oh, if, I'm, if I keep moving, I'll be ready to go. With our cameras nowadays, they can focus in 0.02 to 0.06 seconds. So this feature I don't think is as necessary as it is uh, or as it was back in the day, but you know, you can try it and see if you want to use it or not. Number three is power save. You know, and, and I'm going to come back to the previous slide in just a second, but with the power save is the ability to put the camera to sleep after a determined amount of time. You know, you can say 10 seconds, or if you want to go in minutes, you have the option of one, two, five, or 30 minutes. Now, my cameras that take the W50 batteries are set for 10 seconds. My cameras that do the Z100, I set for a minute. So I do have them go off at a minimum amount of time just to preserve the battery life. Plus when I need to wake them up, they do wake up very quickly. The fourth one is a kind of this at your discretion. Now you can set the display quality from the default standard to a high quality display. I'm that type of person that I like resolution in my files. So I'm a big fan of the R series cameras personally. And I'm also a big fan of the high quality display. So I wanna make sure I can see everything as clearly as possible. Now, this is my try it yourself, see if you like it, but I turn this to high display. So I'm 75% of the way on my cameras with the airplane mode on, pre-AF off, power safe set to 10 seconds. But this one, just cause of me, I leave the, high, uh, the display quality at high. Try it, see if you like it. That's all I can really emphasize, because remember, these are my cameras, not yours. You set up your camera for what works best for you. And this is one of the beautiful things about Miro's cameras, especially the Sony's. And we'll talk more about that momentarily. Now, the final thing I wanna add uh, to your brain about the batteries is a feature called USB power. Now, with USB power, and as you can see on the right, those are the cameras that can only use an external battery bank to charge the camera in the respects that if the camera is turned off, the battery bank is plugged into the, the micro USB slot of the camera, it will charge the internal battery or top it off, depending on what you're doing. Where the cameras on the left and the newer cameras have it where you can charge and shoot. Now, the, the thing I wanna clarify here is that it doesn't charge and shoot at the same time. It doesn't charge a battery as it's, while you're shooting. What it's doing is it's taking over part of the power drain load. And the respects is that the camera recognizes the external battery bank, will draw five, power, uh, five volts of power from the external, and then draw two volts from the internal battery. So it extends the life of the internal battery. So you're able to shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot. And this becomes very useful if you're doing a uh, video or if you're doing interval recording, so like uh, time-lapse. What can happen is if you turn the camera off, then it starts charging the internal battery. So it's similar to the previous models. So on, it works as, you know, it takes the burden off the internal, turn it off, it works as an external battery charger. And it can come very handy. I've had a, it's saved me a couple times. Uh, plus you know, part of the reason is, is I usually carry little external battery banks with me, uh, typically for my smartphone, but I also keep some of my camera bags just in case, because I've, I've had those, you know, cerebral flatulence moments where I'm like, Oh yeah, I've got the batteries and didn't really check and I only had the one in the camera. So check that out. Now, a very useful feature on our cameras is called the function menu. Uh, you're probably wondering what that button on the back of the camera says, says FN. That's the fun button. All it's missing is you. Okay, it's cheesy. I know, cut me a little bit of slack here. It's even more fun when I can see the look on your faces when these classes are live, which I can't wait for the day we go back to. But the function button is a quick, access button. It allows you to access up to 12 settings in your camera so you can make the adjustments very, very quickly. Now, taking a little bit of a closer look at the function menu, 
is when you press the button, you can just scroll through to what you need. Now, by default, these are some of the things that you see, drive mode, flash mode, focus mode, but you can customize it to change them to different features. Maybe you wanna play with the, the dynamic range optimizer, what we call DRO or high dynamic range. You wanna play with the creative styles, you wanna play in picture effects, or maybe you just wanna move the features around to what's more intuitive for you. So maybe out of those 12, maybe you don't wanna use the center eight, you just wanna use the corners. And the corners are maybe the, you know, the drive speed, maybe it's the ISO, maybe it's the exposure compensation. That, that's up to you. And the previous generation cameras actually used a text-based description. So on the function menu, it's really self-explanatory in the respects as page one is the top row, page two is the bottom row and moving them around. The current generation menu system actually uses an icon based, you know, so you have a visual representation of the icons that you would see on the screen, whether it's on the LCD or the EVF. And what's really nice is that the custom key settings and the function menu settings are all on the same page in the same tab. So typically like camera tab two, you'll find them all together. In this case, it's like on page eight of nine. Um, if you have a previous generation camera, you may not have that look. It may be a camera and, and the tab one and tab two is a gear, an icon of a gear, but it's gonna be in that one. Now, one other little tip for your, you say, if anyone who's made the transition from the guys in red, you may notice that the dials are different than the front and back dial. On the guys in red, the front dial controlled your shutter speed, the back dial controlled your aperture. On Sony, it's the other way around. Front dial is lens and aperture, back dial is shutter speed. Now to me, that was always the more logical way to go because what stood out further from the camera body, the lens. What stands out furthest from the camera body? The grip and that dial. So they paralleled each other. I mean, that's how I associate with, that's how I, I kind of made that connection in my brain for logic. But if you're so used to the other way, it is just so ingrained in your brain through so much use, so intuition through repetition, that dial setup underneath the function menu setting, just switch them. Back dial will be your aperture, front dial will be your shutter speed. And then you can go about your business and have a great day. Now let's talk about customizing your buttons. Now, one of my favorite um, you know, kind of graphs to use is this one from the A7R4. You have 13 buttons at your disposal that you can assign one of 113 options. So you really can you know, set this camera up for you. It is awesome in that respects. Now, one of the final buttons that you can use is on lenses. Uh, a variety of our lenses have what's called a focus hold button, which is that little button that uh, those arrows are pointing to. Now, not all lenses have a focus hold button, but if you do have one that does, you can repurpose it. And I do on my cameras. And I will explain that a little bit later as we get down the road to when I talk about my absolute favorite feature from Sony. And there's a lot of great features that I absolutely love, but the one I, I have in this class and presentation is my absolute favorite one. So for the custom menus, same page as I mentioned previously, as long with the function menu. So it's like one-stop shopping. You can set it up where you can set up different custom keys for your stills your video, and your playback. You know, depends which way you want to go. Again, the previous generation uses a text-based, so you do have to know what the button layout is on your camera. You know, it may require reading the instruction manual. You know, guys, I know it's not in our DNA. Believe me, I'm not going to break bro code here when I tell you, read the instruction manual. I won't rat you out. You need to. It's very, very important that you do. But if you don't, and you have a current generation camera and go, ha ha, I can avoid the instruction manual again because the current generation uses visual based icons. Great example here is, okay, basically quote unquote button one is the control wheel on the back of the camera. And they set that for aperture so you can scroll through maximum aperture to minimum aperture very easily. You know, I can set it to the has no feature. It just doesn't do anything, you know? your camera set up for what makes what works best for you. So with that said is if you're new to mirrorless cameras, so maybe this is your, you know, maiden voyage into mirrorless and Sony, one of the things that you're going to love is what's called WYSIWYG. What you see is what you get. And the benefits 
of an EVF or electronic viewfinder. Now, if you come from a DSLR background, you know that when you look through your viewfinder, you're seeing what the lens sees because you have the mirror and the shutter blades blocking the sensor. With a mirrorless camera, you don't have a mirror box getting in the way. So the image goes right from the lens onto the sensor. So you have a real-time preview of your image before you even push the button. What makes this absolutely wonderful is if you're working with special effects, you can see how the special effect is going to you know, appear on your image. You can adjust your focus, your exposure. You can check your white balance. You can check your depth of field so you can see what's going to appear to be in focus. And the EVFs work in almost no light. And that technology keeps advancing at every generation of EVF. Sony's actually the number one manufacturer of EVFs. We're also the number one uh, manufacturer of imaging sensors. And half the devices out there take an imaging sensor that comes from Sony. What I'm, the point I'm trying to make is that if you've come from a DSLR background, you're used to looking at your LCD screen to check your image after you shot it. You know, it was a, a shoot, review your image and adjust. And then you do that shoot re review adjust until you get the image you want. With Sony cameras, you review your image, basically compose your shot, adjust to get your exposure to where you want it, and then shoot. Got it. Now, if you're outside on a day where it's really sunny, you know, looking at an LCD can be kind of difficult. With the EVF, you hold it up to your eye. And guess what? Now your eye gets a big screen TV so you can actually see things at a better field of view and with better quality to make sure you got what you wanted to capture. And what's cool is with EVF, you take the camera away from your eye. There's a sensor in the eyepiece that notices that, and it'll switch it back to the LCD. Now, you do have the ability to have it automatically switch back and forth, or you can choose manual, or uh, sorry, LCD, or you can choose viewfinder. It's up to you. And as a final note on that too, is when you hit the display button on the back of the camera, which is at the very top of the control wheel, it'll scroll through different viewing options for the EVF and the LCD. So you can have as much information like what you see on the screen before you or as little that you require to get the job done. Now, there is one instance where I will tell you to turn Live View off. Other than that, other than this instance, I recommend you leave it on all the time. If you are in a studio environment and you're working with studio strobes, I highly recommend you turn Live View off. And here is why. Is that typically when you are shooting with a studio environment and studio strobes, is your modeling lights, which are the continuous lights that are on the studio strobes, are lower power and they may be at a lower output. So if maybe you shoot proportional with your lights. So if your studio strobes are at full power, the modeling lights at full power. If the studio strobe is at half power, the modeling lights at half power. And you also want to kind of make sure that the ambient light is at a minimum. You don't want to have any con contamination on your color balance, your white balance, if you have, say, fluorescence, fluorescence above. So by doing this with Live View on, you're shooting, say, at, as an example, 1 2 50th of a second at F11, at ISO 100. With Live View on, what's going to happen in a dimly lit room? The image is going to be darn near black. When you turn this off, it'll be like reminiscent of the DSLR days where the lens will open to maximum aperture so you can compose your shot, utilize your autofocus system, then as you push the button to capture the image, stops down, captures the image at F11, ISO 100, 1 250th of a second. After it's done, it reopens up again. Make sense? So studio strobes, turn off, everything else, leave on, because then you'll have that wissy with what you see is what you get. Speaking of white balance, our cameras have presets, like everybody. We have our auto white balance, which a lot of you folks might use more often than not. And I would say, I'd say like 80% of the time, it's going to do the job. But there are times where auto will get confused. And if you're familiar with the Kelvin scale, which is at you know second column, second from the bottom. That's a scientific principle. Uh, I would, uh, there's a, the, the science, one of the science parts of photography is that the Kelvin scale, uh, temperature scale is based on taking a piece of black metal and you start to heat it. 
as it heats up, it actually starts to change color. If you've ever had an art class, we've always been told that reds and oranges and yellows are considered warm or hot colors. And blues and greens, especially blues, are considered cold colors. Scientifically speaking, that is not the case. It's actually the other way around. The higher the temperature, the, the cooler the light goes. And you, you've heard of like, you know, white hot. That's kind of where it comes from. Now, all the icons that you see in uh, before you all tie in with a specific temperature on the Kelvin scale. Like daylight's around 5,600 degrees. Incandescence, about 3,200 degrees. Uh, you know, flashes can be anywhere from 5,600 to 6,000. So they all are approximate. They get you in the ballpark. Now, if you know the Kelvin, you can always dial it in, and that's okay. And the custom, I'll talk about that in a few slides. So again, you may stick with auto white balance because you don't worry about messing things up. And you know what? That is okay. You know, I'd say a good 80% of time the job, time, 80% of the time, the camera's going to do the job for you. Now, this is a great shot. I mean, I really like this shot. I find it very, very heartwarming, very tender because you have a father and son. They are, you know, just in a very comfortable position. They both have these real soft smiles and these great expressions. I mean, the, it, the expression sells it. But I know that color is not correct. I, I know that their skin is not that kind of yellowish, orangish because uh, you're working in incandescent lighting or also tungsten lighting. So if I tell the camera and switch it from auto to incandescent, it cleans up the color. It offsets that incandescent color that's you know indicative of the Kelvin scale. So made the picture even better. Because the amazing thing is, is when you're in that position, you know, actually seeing that live as a human, the gray matter between your ears will automatically process what, you know, the eyes are bringing in. It's like, oh, I know what their skin tones are supposed to be. So guess what? I'm going to make the correction. Cameras sometimes need some help because in auto, it's actually looking for white in the scene to help white balance, to help clean up the colors. And that doesn't have a lot of white, uh, except for that little spot on the little guy's sleeve. Now, if we kind of flip it around and go outside, leave it in auto white balance. You know, out in daylight, not a lot of white there either. You got some blue coming off a little guy's shirt and guess what? That's gonna affect how the camera processes the white balance. So it's actually giving more of a cooler tone to the overall image. Since I know that we're out in daylight, what if I happens if I put the camera's preset to daylight? Well, guess what? I just offset that coolness with some warmth. His skin tone looks better. The texture and the color in the bark looks better and it's a more natural looking image. Now, what about traveling? Again, auto works great, but it's sometimes you're gonna have to tweak it just a little bit. Now, again, dealing with WYSIWYG, what happens if I decide to experiment, explore my creative vision and explore the, the camera's capabilities? What in this tropical situation, it's like, I got this nice sunset. What happens if I start scrolling through my presets? What happens if I throw it at daylight? Daylight looks really good. I mean, a lot of rich, warm tones. And as we're approaching winter, and if you're in the Midwest or somewhere where you get a winter, you know, you might be that type of person who sends this type of picture to people who have snow and cold weather when you're there just to torment them and say, ha ha, I'm here, you're not. Now, if you think I'm one of those people, you are absolutely correct. I would do that. Because <laughs> it's I don't take vacations that often. It'll be an actually awesome place to be. And I would also want to share that with my friends and family because it is a beautiful shot. Now, but what if I see that there's some other color tones in there? What if I say, you know what, I'm going to move it from daylight just for fun. How's it looking fluorescent? I still keep my warmth, but now I'm bringing out some of those kind of those magenta tones, some of those pinks and a little bit of purples in there. Still creates a nice shot. But you know what? I, I didn't use the proper you know, preset because you know, it is kind of daylight. Why, what happens if I go and, and do that? I don't use the correct setting. What's going to happen? Nothing. I mean, it, the camera is not going to send a signal to the photo police to, to have them come show up at your house in the middle of the night, stuff you in a burlap bag and beat you with a rubber hose for not using the correct setting. You're a creative. You should experiment because with the WYSIWYG, you can find out what you like and what you don't like and then Work within those. It's it's okay to make some mistakes or experiment to see what happens. You, you, I mean, I've always, I learn best by doing. I think some of our greatest successes have come from previous failures. So explore, play, have fun, 
Because in my opinion, if it isn't fun, why do it? And photography should be fun. I mean, granted, it starts with a pH, but it sounds like, pfft. what's, what's uh, the after that? Fun. I mean, you have a fun button on your camera. It's just missing you. So I, I just, I couldn't help myself. I'm sorry. So the final piece I wanted to talk about is the custom white balance setting. Now, the presets work off of the light, the guesstimated light. With the custom white balance, you're actually going to be working off the light that's actually there in the scene. And to be able to do this, you do require a little added accessory to help you capture the custom white balance. Now, there's a plenty of devices that are out there to help you create a custom white balance. I personally use two, uh, two different ones. One is a collapsible target from a company called Lastalite. It's called the Easy Balance. And the Easy Balance is very similar in the respects of you ever seen those collapsible reflectors uh, we, uh, I work for a company, we call them zip disks, where you reflected light and it changed colors. Well, with the, the last side easy balance, you have white on one side and gray on the other. And each side is what's called spectrally neutral. They're not haunted. Spectrally neutral means there's no hint uh, or no, there's no tint or hue on either side. They're, each side is equal values of red, green, and blue, just in different values. So why, would they just ha why don't they just have one side? Well, depends on what you're doing. Now, say you're out somewhere where it's very sunny, you know, the reflected white coming to the camera may be too much for the camera to process for exposure. So you might use the gray side, which is completely fine. It says, okay, you're telling the camera, this is equal values of red, green, and blue. Take your reading off of this. If you say you're inside where maybe it's a dimly lit, the gray, it can, the camera can get a prosper reading because it's too dark. Flip it to the white side and help reflect more light back. All can be done through that. Now I'm gonna come back to the slide in just a real quick second because there's a reason for it. But when you actually activate the custom white balance, you'll actually see a, now it's like a circle that pops up. Just put the circle on your target, hit the center button. And once you do that, it will actually bring you into where you wanna place it. You have three options in the custom settings, a one, two, or a three. Now, when I used to shoot weddings, I usually had three different lighting, uh, lighting areas I had to deal with. One was, my studio setup, because I had my studio lights set up. Number two was the hall itself. You know, not sometimes I had windows, sometimes it didn't. And third was usually out in the lobby because I was working with big groups on stairs. And those were typically tungsten or incandescent lighting. My studio strobes were set for studio, which were more in the daylight balanced area. And then the hall could be all over the place. You know, so I always had to be very careful. So I always had three different shots set up in the camera so I can always go back to it. With the custom settings with three, all I would have to do is just remember what setting, what number correlated with what room and what lighting setup and much easier to do. Now, the final piece I wanted to give you, and this is a really cool little secret kind of in the Sony system because most people don't read the instruction manuals. See this little symbol right here, this little arrow pointing to the right? You will see this pop up in white balances in general. What it's saying is that if I go to the right, I'm going to go into a sub menu and it's going to bring up a color square that's gridded. And the respects is that I can adjust the hint or tint or hue to help change the color a little bit. Maybe you like to have your images have a little look to it. So you can adjust the amber to blue, the green to magenta to in points in between to season the lighting just a little bit. So it doesn't have to be so on. Maybe it's like, you know, maybe it's like you do the, the custom white balance and you're like, maybe it's just, I just want a little something there. I just want to warm it up just a little bit for flesh tones. And I can go in there and do that. This can be done in auto. It can be done in flash. It can be done in any of the other presets as well. So it's a really cool feature to check out. Talking about focus areas is we do have a number and there's a reason for them. The primary one that if you're, say, as you're learning the camera, you have it set for auto is the camera will sit in wide focus area. Now, what's a benefit to the wide focus area is that you're using all autofocus points that are available. If you happen to have an A7 III, that's 693 face detection autofocus points and 425 contrast. That results in 93% of the sensor covered in focusing points. The downside is, is that with wide, it is a front priority focusing system. So it assumes that your subject is closest to the camera. In this case, with the glasses set up, it happens to be one in orange. 
it's okay. You know, it's like you always make adjustments as necessary. The second one is zone. Now zone is very similar in the respects is that it is a front priority focusing system. But what you can do is work with nine boxes to say, stay in this area. You know, I'm going to put it on what's important to me. So stay in that area. So works nice. Now, an example like this little one of the little bird in its nest is you've got those, you know, those twigs and branches kind of coming back towards the camera. In wide, the camera will probably detect that, hey, there's something closer to the camera. So it's on the, the twig and the branch and not the nest. Here I can say, nope, stay in this area, but right here. The third one is center autofocus area. Now, this one has been common in cameras for literally decades. And it uses a larger kind of point in the center that you can use to get your subject. You know, for traditionally people would, you know, auto, you know, use, put the center point where they wanted it, lock the focal distance, and then recompose as necessary. With flexible spot, you don't have to do that. You can move your focus point around. So compose your shot and then put your focus point where you need it. And you have three different sizes of focusing areas or boxes that you can work with with flexible spot. You have a small, medium, and a large. Now we do have a kind of an offshoot of flexible spot. It's called expanded flexible spot. And that will actually have three focusing points above, below, and one on each side of your main focus point. So you're technically working with nine with the emphasis on the one that's dead center. Now, if you happen to have one of the full frame cameras that actually has a multi-selector or what we affectionately call the joystick, you can use that to move your focus points around. If you have a camera that has a touch screen, which is you know, pretty common in the current generation of cameras, if touch operation is turned on, touch the screen where you want the focus point to be, and that's where it'll go. If you are working with a previous generation camera, it does take an extra step. And the respects is that you have to press the, the function button, go to your focus area, select what focusing area you want to work with, in this case, flexible spot, use the dial to put the focusing point where you want it, then hit the center uh, button on the back to lock it in and then go back to shooting. So it sounds a little bit more than it is, but it's only a couple of steps. And the irony is that you do it enough, it just becomes second nature. You don't even think about it. Now, talking about our newest system that I mentioned very early on in the presentation about the tracking. Now we've had what's called center lock, lock or lock on AF, and it used three points of artificial intelligence. It was a it was the face, the distance, and color. So when you, this was active, is it would bring up in the center of the image a, a box within a box, a square within a square. So you'd put that on your subject, hit the center button on the back of the camera, and then you would see the, the box expand to cover your subject. And then it would know to stay with that based off of the face, the color, and distance that it saw. With the new tracking system, what we call real-time tracking is we added two new points of AI or artificial intelligence, eye and pattern. So now it's using those five points of AI to lock onto your subject. And the cameras that have real-time feature, it will show up in the focus area at the very bottom with it kind of looks like a pyramid because the icon is so small, but it's actually showing a shutter button that's being like pressed halfway down. So to differentiate the tracking symbol versus all the others is, you know, using the wide focus area. You used to have these little dancing boxes, the little green boxes, uh, the blinkies as I used to call them. When you have tracking on, even in wide, you don't get the blinking boxes, you get the box with a vertical line on each side. I jokingly call it 101, if you like to speak binary, LOL, if you're just a happy, optimistic person, uh, or if you're a big movie fan, if you remember Ready Player One, IOI. <laughs> so it's just little things I use to remember all this stuff. You can also, if it's set up properly in the camera, in the respects of touching the screen. So instead of working off the focusing point to start and let the camera track, you can say, touch the screen right here, and it'll know to use those five points of AI to start following your subject. Now, the caveat I'll have for you, too, is if you want to work with the uh, flexible spot, expanded flexible spot. If your subject moves too far away from them, you know, from the main point, the camera can switch on you, you know, switch to focusing points. Uh, and I'll explain a little bit more about that uh, when we get to my favorite section and why I shoot the way I do. Uh, believe me when I, I tell you there is a method to the madness. 
there is a lot of madness, but there is a method to it. Moving into the autofocus modes is that we have the standard autofocus single and the autofocus continuous. You know, the, in a nutshell, the difference between the two is AFS. You know, put you know, compose your shot, push the shutter halfway down, wherever the focus point is at, the camera will engage the, the system and then lock at that distance. So as long as you keep the shutter button held halfway down, it'll stay at that distance. As soon as you release and push halfway down again, it reactivates, which is great if you're dealing with a non-moving subject, it's fine. But if your subject has a tendency to move or does move, you have AFC, autofocus continuous. So you compose your shot, get your focusing point on your subject, push your shutter halfway down, engages the system and as long as you keep it held halfway down, it will stay tracking your subject. You may that be that person's like, you know, I don't know which one I want to stay with. Maybe I'll try this AFA or autofocus auto. It's a hybrid between the two systems. It normally sits in AFS, but when it detects that your subject has moved, it will switch to AFC, you know, and so it requires the, the proper focus for your subject. Now, I will tell you that, you know, I personally don't use this feature. Uh, the way I was trained as a photographer for the people that I've worked for was to always be attentive to the subject matter. And I shot weddings for 25 years. So I was always very cognizant of my subject matter and making sure, you know, things were good, not only them, but what was going on in the background as well. So I personally don't use the feature just based on my training, but I would recommend try it. It may work perfectly and wonderfully for you. So you won't know unless you try. And at the very least, you learn what you don't like about your camera, which for me with Sony's, there's not a, not a lot. I can't think of anything I really don't like about the cameras. They just work so wonderfully. We do have two other features when it comes to focusing. One is called DMF, which stands for direct manual focus, which will be a topic of, for another class. Um, and in a nutshell, it's a hybrid between autofocus and manual focus. So kind of did the same thing, push the shutter halfway down, but while it's held, you can override manual focus and do that. But with manual focus, it's all in your hands. And there's two features you'll probably like to try out to really utilize the manual focus features of your camera. The first one is called focus peaking. Now watch the young lady there. And you'll see her get a little, those little indications of red. Now what that red means, that's the area that's gonna be in focus based off of the aperture. Because remember, we have WYSIWYG. What you see is what you get. So this is a feature in the cameras that you can turn on or off, and it'll do it when it's in manual focus. You can choose the level of sensitivity, low, mid, or high. And then you can choose the color. Traditionally, it has been red, yellow, and white. Newer cameras also have blue. So my sample camera, so if I uh, do get the opportunity to meet you out in the field, is you'll see this, the cameras that are red, yellow, that only had red, yellow, white are set for red. The newer cameras that have the option of blue are set for blue. It, to me, they just stand out better compared to the yellows and whites. Uh, for me, you know, you, the only time I turn off the red is if I'm shooting something that is red. It just makes life easier. And the second one uh, feature is called focus magnifier. So say you're doing your macro photography, and this is how the, the composition of your shot. But you really wanna make sure that that, the, that leaf, that pedal, I think that's the correct term, pedal is sharp. So I put in manual focus, I start to rotate the focus ring, I can have it zoom in to where the focus point is at, and then I can critically focus my subject. Now, if I wanna make sure that it's really focused and super duper sharp, you know, I can also go in the focus magnifier and increase the magnification to make sure that it is as sharp as it can be. And then when I push the button all the way down, I get this image overall and knowing that the plane of focus is razor sharp. So again, you can turn this on or off, but what you can also do is set it for a time limit. If you're on limited time or you just wanna make sure, you know, you wanna be dilly dallying around, you can set it for no limit, five seconds or two seconds. Um, as you're learning the, your lenses, you may say no limit. And then over time, as you become more comfortable with how your lenses focus, you can shorten the time. You know, if you remember the old TV show back in the day called Name That Tune, well, I can focus that image in two seconds. Well, focus that image. Okay, I just really show how old I am or just how knowledgeable I am of trivia. A little bit of both. 
Now we come up to my absolute favorite feature in the Sony system. It's called eye autofocus. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, I shot for as a freelancer for 25 years. It was like weddings and portraits and events. And for me, it's this is that feature as a portrait photographer I absolutely love because what the camera is doing is it is running a face detection algorithm. So it looked for the face, looks for the eyes, and focuses on the eye closest to the camera. And in another case with an auto, it's what it perceives to be closest to the camera. In this case, with Sam, it actually focused on her right eye. So, you know, uh, the back eye. The one of Abigail here, since her one eye is partially obscured, but it still is okay, it definitely grabbed onto her again, her right eye, but it's extremely sharp. So this is, this feature in the camera lets me focus as the photographer slash director on getting the right expression for my subject. You know, not to worry about what my focus point is, I can let the camera do its job. So I'm more focused on the overall image I'm trying to capture. Now the picture of Sam was shot in a studio. I was shooting with the A7R3 with the 70 to 200 2.8 G master lens at, if I remember correctly, like 5.6. I was shooting at AFC, autofocus continuous, because Sam is actually a professional dancer. And if there's music going on, the girl does not stand still. She's be bopping all around the place. So as she was you know, moving, I want to make sure I had her sharp. My, my focus was correct because AFC, if I'm an AFS and say she's kind of leaning forward towards the camera and then shifts her weight back say, to a back foot and I'm locked at the front position, it's going to be out of focus. In AFC, it stays with her, keeping that eye sharp. The one of Abigail was shot with our 135 1.8 G master lens at F 1.8 and I was using continuous lighting, daylight balanced. The 135, first off, may be the sharpest lens I have ever worked with in my life. It is redonkulously sharp. But also, too, is I really wanted shallow depth of field, or most people call bokeh. You know, I'm old school. I'd still call it shallow depth of field because you can see her ear has started to go soft, the tat, her shoulders, you know, but her eye is tack sharp. Look at, I mean, you can count her eyelashes. That's how sharp that lens is. The 7200 does a great job, too. In this case, with, with Abigail, it's like I wanted that fall off. I wanted emphasis on her very piercing eyes. So AFC, I was using wide focus area. So I was letting the camera use all the focusing points because if I'd gone to center or if I'd gone to flexible spot or expanded flexible spot, if I was too, her face and moved too far away from that point, it would actually have gone back to the focus point, not to her face. So it lets me use all the focusing uh, points in the wide area. That's why I recommend it. And this is also typically where I have the focus hold button on my lenses set for eye autofocus because I don't always use the real time tracking for eyes because sometimes I have more than one person in there. So it, it can, the camera's not always sure who to focus on. So I can say, you know what? I don't want eye autofocus on all the time. I just want it when I want to use it. So I can turn the face priority or the eye priority off. And then I have to set it up as a custom button. But when it is on, I always turn on the face detection frame because the camera is still going to work with the eye autofocus. But if it loses the eye, it's going to work the face detection. And that face detection frame just gives you that verbal reassurance that the camera and lens are still working to get the proper autofocus point. You know, if it's not there, some people freak out a little bit. Here, just saying, you got that. Yeah, I'm still working. You're okay. Now, as I mentioned before about second generation cameras is it was a custom setting. You had to assign it to a button or multiple buttons, whatever is easiest for you. So all of my cameras, I have it, I autofocus set to AEL and the focus hold button on the lens. So right there, they're in the typically the same page. I just tell it these two say IAF. Now, the reason I do this is not all of my lenses have a focus hold button, but typically with the exception of the A7C, all of my cameras have an AEL button. So I always had it at my disposal, no matter what. Like I said, I can always turn it back on if I want and do the real time, but I don't always want it on. And that's just my choice. So try it. Again, just go in, set it, I autofocus. And then with the second generation cameras, you have a little toggle switch 
over here when it's toggled up that button can do a different you know it can be set up for something different in the am mf mode toggle down it's now set for eye autofocus or whatever you set it up for now i've kind of mentioned it but i've kind of saved it is our cameras now do animal eye autofocus it is a feature that sony actually announced that they were developing back in september of 2018 at photokina at a big show uh, in cologne germany I'm saying this was coming now with its introduction it does really an amazing job with dogs and cats uh, and horses um, birds are still being worked on it does a decent job uh, it's kind of ironic is that it can actually lock onto the dragons from game of thrones which is pretty funny um, birds because there's so many species you know that that's always in the works you know this technology is still in its infancy and it's only going to get better now if you're one of the sony kids who have been with us for a while and have seen the early you know versions of human eye autofocus and what it can do now it's it's not even night and day i mean it is so far advanced the animal tech uh, eye autofocus is just going to keep getting better and better like i said that's great now it's just going to get better and the same thing is like with humans you have the choice of you know having either the eye box you know the box on and a face detection display as well for the animals i encourage you to put them on i really really do it's not going to hurt so as we come closer to the end of our presentation i'm going to talk to you about some of the stuff that you can do with the camera uh, in camera by getting creative there are two kind of features really close to each other in the menu system picture effects and creative style now picture effects only work when the camera is in jpeg mode and only jpeg mode creative style will work in any of the quality formats whether it's raw by itself jpeg by itself or raw and jpeg and there's less options in the creative style uh, because it's just you're kind of telling it like hey i'm, I'm working and i want just standard looking jpegs or i want more popular colors i want i'm working portraits so i can soften my saturation a little bit landscapes you know a little more contrast uh, black and white self-explanatory so if you have picture effects uh, or picture or creative style set up for black and white and you're shooting raw and jpeg your jpegs will be set as black and white and that's how they'll be written and your raw will be color because you can always go back and play with it. Make sense? Good. So some examples of the picture effects, which again, only work in JPEG, you have quite a few options where it's you know soft focus, a toy camera look, you wanna warm it up, you wanna give a retro look, you wanna play with high contrast uh, mono, monotone, illustration and watercolor. And versus that one plant here is just a few uh, you know, samples of say the painting mode. Illustrator. Partial color. Now, this is a fun one to play with if you really want to emphasize one shade. Now, I think you've kind of picked up on I'm a bit of a trivia buff and I'm a huge movie fan. So whenever I see something like this, it reminds me of kind of a, two movies. One is The Sixth Sense, where red was a very important aspect in the movie. If you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend the movie. It is really, really a good flick. The second one, is a more of a serious drama. It's Schindler's List from Steven Spielberg. Uh, if you haven't seen the movie, there's a very iconic and very powerful scene of this little girl walking through the concentration camp and she's wearing a red coat. Now, what makes this so significant is the movie shot in black and white. So she's going through all this, 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 these atrocities and she's just there, just kind of, of oblivious to what's going on. Extremely powerful scene. High contrast black and white. Now I have some friends who do like uh, like uh, who are coin collectors, and they like to use this feature for their coins that are of course more on the silver side or lighter side, because with the the higher contrast it helps show more of the edges on coins a little bit more worn through time. So it, it helps define them a little bit better. Miniature look. And now let's get to the points where like our our software. You know, as a, for mobile applications, we have Imaging Edge, which is a free download from either Google Play or the App Store. And there's a couple, of, uh, a few versions of it. The primary one is Imaging Edge Mobile. Uh, the other ones will deal with uh, like uh, movie edits and transfer and tagging. Uh, and it's really kind of cool for if you're doing like with A9s, you have to get images over really quick. 
Now we just introduced on December 1st, a new one called Visual Story for wedding and event photographers um, who need to, who wanna get their images up even faster. So you can shoot and get them right to an online gallery, like right away. So you can still, you know, kind of capitalize on the emotions of the moment. Now, just as a note too, the Visual Story does have plans based on how much uh, space you're gonna take up on the cloud and you can check that out. But, you know, Imaging Edge Mobile itself is free. Uh, you can use it to transfer images directly from your camera. So if you just shot an image, and you want to say, oh, this is great. Like so maybe it's that sunset I it showed you earlier. You know, you can hit playback on the camera, pick that image, hit the fun button, launch the software, and then it'll transfer. You know, once they connect, it'll transfer the image from the camera to the phone or a smart device. Now, to make sure you can be able to do this, you do have to have control with smartphone turned on. When you turn it on, you now have the ability to use your smartphone as a remote. Now, to connect, previous generations, you actually have to type in the password. Newer cameras, you can use your cameras, uh, your smartphone's camera to utilize the QR code to connect. Now, if you're gonna play with this feature at home, I'm gonna warn you. Uh, simply because I've run into this so many times in my four and a half years, is that people are like, I'm at home. I can't get this software and my camera to work. What's going on? I'm like, are you at home? Yeah. Okay. Your phone is connecting to your home Wi-Fi network. It's typically the number one favorite. So you have to tell your phone to connect to the camera. So in the Wi-Fi settings, not the Bluetooth, the Wi-Fi, you have to pick the camera. So you look for that direct yada, 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 model name, hit that so it starts connecting, go back to Imaging Edge, you know, hit start to connect and then give it a few seconds. And then you should have, you know, a live view directly from your camera to your, sm your smartphone. And typically this is what you'll see in the beginning. So it'll tell you that it's connected to the camera. You can use the Bluetooth in the camera and your phone to create GPS or location information. You can check, you know, thumbnails and the images from your transferred images. And what's nice is once you pair up your, your phone and your camera, the software remembers what you have connected. So it can give you news on firmware updates to your, to your camera or even lenses if necessary. Uh, if there's a survey, we would love for you to participate because Sony does listen. And sadly, you can't see it under here because I did not create the slide, but I know who did. Um, it'll actually give you an option to pick an online manual based on the camera that you're working with. So if you want to, if you're working with say an A7 III, you know, your A7 III um, settings, like I want to see the online manual for that. If you're working with say an RX100, okay, I want to see the online manual for that. It remembers the cameras that have been connected. You can also change the settings. You can change the orientation from landscape to portrait or vertical. You can do video too, start and stop video. Now the other free download you can use as well is for, it's called Imaging Edge Desktop. And that is a way for you to shoot remotely, whether you're cabled from your camera to your laptop or desktop. If you have a camera that's capable of Wi-Fi shooting, like the A9 Mark II, A7R4, A7S III, and the A7C, you can do wireless tethering to your laptop or desktop. Once you shoot to the computer, you can use the viewer portion to pick what images you wanna work with. And then you take it to the edit section to convert your, your raw files to something else like a JPEG. And also through the Imaging Edge desktop, you can utilize the create time-lapse movie when you're doing your interval shooting. And if you happen to have an R3 or an R4, a feature called pixel shift, you can combine your images from pixel shift to create an extremely detailed and high resolution image. And the final thing is Imaging Edge webcam. So now you can use your Sony camera as a high quality webcam. You know, free, again, free download and plug it, you know, follow instructions, plug it in, let the camera use, you know, face detection, eye autofocus if it has that in video to be able to track with you as you use the webcam. If you happen to have a full frame camera, you know, it helps create a more blurred background, you know, you know shallower depth of field or better bokeh. Smaller chip cameras inherently have more depth of field. So sometimes you gotta be careful what's in the background. It's an easy setup. And it, so you can, instead of traveling with more gear, you know, you can have one cable plugged into your camera. Now you have a really nice webcam. So at this point, folks, I just wanna say thank you so much for joining me today at the ProCam stage. 
of Creative Space Online. So again, please check out alphauniverse.com. Check out our other presenters this weekend uh, during uh, Creative Space. Some amazing talent here and amazing information. Uh, check out ProCam. Check out the sales and, and specials. Uh, have an absolutely wonderful holiday season. Uh, God bless. Keep calm and chive on. And we'll see you guys in the future. Take care.